Uh, okay, so, um, welcome back. It's July, and it's the first, like, I mean, I guess it's the second movie, but we've had, like, we've had blind watches, and we've had other things, but we, this is our first, like, lecture series thing, and, uh, hopefully we get back into it. I have sort of discovered a weird approach into it, um, through kind of some frustration with, like, so I had to start taking, uh, classes in person again, and since I'm taking animation classes at a community college, it's, like, everyone in my classmates are, like, 20-year-olds, right? And they're all, they all want to tell stories. They're all interested in storytelling, but they're also not interested in actually learning how to do it, right? Um... They all think their ideas are well well developed and well thought out and that they're ready to go. And then they start, like, you know, eventually the story, like, the word gets out that I've worked in the industry or whatever. And then they start going, like, oh, let me talk to you about my story, which I'm like, okay, cool. Tell me your story. And they start pitching, um, like, their story is halfway through Act 1. And they're like, I've been thinking about this for years. And I'm like, you haven't actually even thought of what the story is. You don't have a story yet. What you have is a setting. And you have maybe an inciting incident. But that's usually about where it stops. And one thing I realized is that world building has become such a big term... I blame kind of, you know, Star Wars, like the, the recent, everything being Star Wars or the MCU makes me feel like maybe that's kind of the thing. The big universe, world building, where does everything take place? And so we've really entered into a period of like setting is key instead of like, oh my God, fucking watch. <laughs> this, this, this watch when I'm voice at, like, in the voice booth, it's always the one thing I forget to put on Do Not Disturb. And so then I'll be, like, in a big line, and then it's just, like, zzz, and I'm just, like, fuck you. And I'll be, like, it's just one message. I could probably just keep going. And then it's, like, the group, turns out it's the group chat, and so then it's just, like, zzz, 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 and you're, like, ah, fuck me. Anyway, um, the, uh, Set, yeah, setting is king. Setting is everything. And that is the worst thing to be king. I it, I guess it's that's the era now. It's elect the worst leaders possible. And that is that is the king. But the setting is interesting. Setting impacts a lot of what you're doing, but setting is not the world. I mean, it, setting is literally the world, but setting is not <laughs> setting is not going to save you setting is going to like there is one person in literary history who has been saved by world building because their world was so immaculate and amazing maybe aldix huxley, huxley but i was actually thinking of dante alardi like or however you say that dante dante is the only person who wrote a crap story Islamophobic also, by the way. But he wrote a crap story, but his setting was so good. We're like, yeah, we're going to we're going to run with this. But that's not the case anymore. I think Virginia Woolf killed it for us. And and thank Virginia Woolf for that. Um anyway, but yeah, Dante's Inferno basically I mean, the Divine Comedy sucks. I mean, I've only made it halfway through maybe the second book and um it's fan fiction it's fan fiction as fuck it's <laughs> it, it it really reads with the aesthetics of fan fiction and um the poetics work in like the italian and it gets some language boost because translators are like well this is an amazing thing so i'm gonna translate the language up but uh, I have been assured by English professors that <laughs> one of my professors, this is not my take, but this is one of my professors take was basically the poetics are only good because the Italian language 
ends with vowels all the time, so it's very difficult to not rhyme in Italian. And so they're like, it's not even like particularly difficult. So the translators are having a much more difficult time, and they're making a much more complex poetic translation so you may go like but the language of dante is amazing you might just be reading it in translation uh, dante's divine comedy is neither divine nor comedy discuss <laughs> yeah and, and what maya said is it's self-insert fan fiction it literally is incel self-insert fan fiction where the girl who you liked who's rejected you constantly has died and she is trying to bring you your soul into heaven because she cares about you so much. And, but you're, a, you're, you have a chance of going to hell and then you go to, and so they're going to, so she, you're, you're the girl who doesn't even like you, who didn't want to marry you, tells you that you're, you know, walk through hell and see what the afterlife is like. So that way you may change your ways. So it's like the fiction, the first major fiction is that this woman cares about him. And then, um, and then the next major fiction is everyone he disagrees with is in hell. Everyone he likes is not in hell. Uh, or they're in hell for good reasons. Um, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it was the original Christian Hell House. Um, yeah, she died just to avoid you. Uh, okay, um, okay, so... This is the High and Low Showcase, where we look at film. I, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir today, but we there were new people, so we're looking at films that are either high or low, or a combination of the two, and we do close readings of them. Uh, M.A.S.H. was originally a memoir sold as fiction about three army doctors in the Korean War. Um, the novel was picked up by the screenwriter Ring Larder Jr., uh, who was a prolific screenwriter in the 40s and then got blacklisted for being a leftist during the Red Scare. Um, and then this was, this one was, but they, they, the citation needed section on his Wikipedia is he continued working for Fox uncredited, right? Because he was a good, he was good at his job. So he worked as a script doctor, he worked as a writer, but they just didn't credit him because he was blacklisted for being a communist, right? And, uh, but anyway, uh, and that's interesting to me. And that also rings very real to me. Um, I don't believe like anyone who gets canceled isn't just still collecting a check or working in some other capacity. Um, the, uh, at least if they're good at their job, uh, Hollywood is really good at including people who are not very good. And then if they get canceled, they're like, you know what? We didn't actually need you. Um, but anyway, uh, and so while the, uh, well, so while the blacklist was lifted before he worked on MASH, uh, when he wrote the screenplay, no one wanted to touch it. They thought it was, uh, like, actually, I'm not even sure what they thought it was, but I mean, the blacklist probably didn't help but also, um, and part of why he was blacklisted was because when he testified before Congress, he looked really bad before the nation. I don't know what that means. That's just sort of what the documents sort of said. I don't know what he said or how he said it, but he seemed like a hostile witness before Congress. And then they were like, huh, we don't like that. You should be nice to Congress, right? Um, I, I think it was more he was a little bit Elizabeth Warren-y, kind of like, Kind of like, I don't see why I'm here. Or maybe like Hillary Clinton and Benghazi. Like, why are you wasting my time here? Uh, and then they were like, how dare you? Oh, yay. Ren is here. Um, and anyway. Um, and so anyway, no one wanted to work on it. They showed it before, like, I think the number was 18 directors and everyone said no. And then they finally got Robert Altman, who arguably also didn't want to touch the script either because which is a weird thing to say about the director who ended up directing the movie um because um he ignored the script he took the general idea of it he got ideas and gists of certain scenes and some general order of it so the scene actually so the 
overall film has a bit of like an arc to it like you can kind of feel like a three-act structure in a way but the interesting thing about this film is that they threw away the dialogue they threw away the script they kind of just went with the gist of the scene they were like who's in this scene where is the scene what is basically happening in the scene and then they said okay actors improv they did improv half of this shit is just actor writing which actor writing i could do another showcase <laughs> on actor writing i uh, like a big thing is you got to be like as a writer, you have to understand different aesthetics of writing. And so, like, I feel like there's big differences between improv writing, actor writing, which also is a lot like improv writing. Um, there's also um, storyboard artist writing. There's also, like, film write cinema writing. And there's um, uh, literary writing. There's uh, TV writing. And, like... All these things all have different aesthetics and different priorities. And you can kind of see who, what everyone's story priorities are based upon how they write. And uh, if you know how to do all of these, then you can actually work quite well in these different forms. Uh, which is called being a formalist writer, which is what I am. And I encourage a lot of people to study writing from a formulist perspective and in order to do that you basically go what is this what is the medium we're talking about um and you also base your aesthetic in the general ideas outside of what the medium is if you really start going if you begin your writing career at what are good screenplays and how do i write them you're going to be a screenwriter and you're going to be a heavy screenwriter. If you go, what is a good poem and how do I write them? You're going to be very much a poet. But if you're like, what is narrative? What is plot? What is story? Then you're going to be able to work in video games. You're going to, Because eventually you're going to get to the question of what is a good screenplay? What is a good poem? What is a good video game? Uh, but you're not necessarily going to um uh but if you start off with the general like what is story what is plot then you uh can are a lot more flexible with these things um let's see so uh yeah so basically so so there's um so at the premiere of mash uh ring lauder jr the screenwriter uh, watched the film and saw that not a single word of his script was in it. And he was heartbroken. He was like, this isn't my movie at all. And then in a weird, like, BoJack Horseman style twist, the only Oscar this movie won was for best screenplay of an adapted medium. And it's like, there... <laughs> <laughs> and so Ring Lauder Jr. got his got the Oscar. And it's like you you get kind of like a like Yeah, it's like imagine imagine the conflicted feelings you spend your entire career and then the thing that like basically had you had nothing to do with is the thing you are successful for. Uh, I'm having a little bit of that on YouTube right now because uh, I have videos I've put effort in, like this one, like that I have uploaded to YouTube, and nothing. I uploaded clips so I could have reactions from My Little Pony fan media, just so I could have like the one line from it to add to a post, and they sat there for 10 years and no one's looking at it. Now I'm like popular... Like, one of my videos has, like, 30,000 views, and it's literally just, like, a line of a pony crying. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, and I'm just like, oh, all right, okay. Um, and, uh, oh, that's your patent, in a way? Oh, so you had, like, little, little to do with it, but then that's, like, the big thing is, like, you have a patent. Uh, today, Sharif discovers TikTok. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, 
Yeah, and so um, so Robert Altman basically went rogue on this uh, production, and uh, the stars of the film started to hate him. They even tried to get him fired. Um, and uh, where are the name? It's Donald Sutherland and uh, Elliot Gold. Yeah, they they um, uh, they tried to get him fired. Uh, the actors who played Hawkeye and um, Trapper. Uh, no, the in the film, Alan Alda is not in the film. I will talk a lot about Alan Alda. I I will talk a lot about the film versus the the show. Okay. Uh, but yes, Alan Alda is not in this. The only later on in my notes, the only person who is in both the movie and the show that I could tell um, that was a major enough role to pay attention to, maybe one of the background nurses. Um, wasn't moved moved from one to the other but um but the only person i could tell is radar o'reilly he's he's the only yeah radar is the only one and he's like a baby in this film uh and then it's weird well he's a baby baby. (laughs) he kind of is perpetual baby because like the show runs for a long time like like this movie was 1970 and i think the show ends in 1983 so it's like he basically is like 18 years old and then in the end he's like maybe 30 <laughs> and he's still baby cuz the Korean War was only 3 years old 3 years long. So so he's still basically playing the same age, right? Um anyway, so um so the actors try to get uh Robert Altman fired. Uh, because he is insane and this is not the way you make a movie and he's kind of abusive and whatever and Robert Altman just kind of goes because he's like this rogue auteur he's like all right use that and so in the later scenes you actually start seeing them getting like very angry with authority figures (laughs) they're just like fuck you like before they're dismissive and don't acknowledge authority and then later they're just like I hate this guy. Get him the fuck out of here, right? Like, and it's and you can see like he's there. He's telling them, "Use your rage at me, at the authority figures in this film," and you can kind of see it. Um, as a director, Altman is not a good director, and uh, at least Mash is not well directed, and uh. Mash is not a great film. We are kind of starting off, like I said, we were talking about how, like, world is king and people who don't feel like they don't want to, like, they they feel like their instinctive approach to creative writing is really going to pull them through. And this is, this film is kind of written, written, like, that instinctive idea of telling a story. And, um, so this film is not necessarily good. We're going to look at kind of from my perspective. I mean, it's also, it's one of the great films of cinema. We should study it. We should look at it. We should be looking at the low and the high. This film is regarded as high, but I think it's low and it is low. It is low art. Uh, it is definitely meant to be high and low art. I look at it as just low art. People regard it as high art. Um, yeah, but the, um... But I think, uh, but I think Altman is more impactful for the things he inspired than the things he actually did. Uh, the TV show Mash is a perfect example of that. The TV show is so much better than the film, and it's because they brought in writers to work on it to have to bring in the moral center of the themes that Mash kind of picked up on and flush them out and actually work on them uh, in a significant and impactful manner, but also to work on the jokes so that way they are driven by story rather than just some asshole picks up an umbrella and starts fencing with it because that's the next thing to do, right? Um, And uh, so anyway... um, uh, also, uh, a big influence is MASH is a huge influence for Wes Anderson. You can actually see, like, uses of zoom lens, um, the, uh, the uses of dialogue and overlapping dialogue. This is dramatically impactful on Wes Anderson. Even the, the, like, click-click whistle that, uh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox does, 
that's stolen from Hawkeye in Ma- in the film Mash. He doesn't do it in the show. He does it in the film. So, um, so I'd say Wes Anderson is is a much better director inspired by Altman. Um, and, uh, but yeah, he doesn't do it in the show. I think Alvin Alda would have found the, the click obnoxious and condescending to the audience. Um, and, uh, that said, um, if you only seen the show, uh, oh yeah, I just talked about that. Uh, Katie jumped us to that. Um, let's see. Uh, Altman is not really good at telling a story with film, but, uh, what was more, what he was more good at was the logistics of making a film. Uh, he liked the idea of recreating people talking over each other. And so, uh, that's difficult to manage, uh, in terms of producing this clearly. Um, so what he did was he put lav mics on each of the individual actors. So they would have their own audio channel rather than, so then he could mix and post five different audio channels rather than have a boom mic and have one audio channel that then is a muddy mess, right? Um, and so that actually makes the the um, the overlapping dialogue very clear to do. Uh, so that's actually a brilliant thing that hasn't been done before. Um, he also liked to just use the zoom mic and tell the actors to have a bit, not zoom mic, zoom lens, and he'd tell the actors to be doing a bit constantly like just just like you work your work something out with your other partner and this is where like also lore comes in very heavily because each character is given a backstory they're given a lot of lore and so then that helps the actors to create their um to create what they're pulling from when they are making their their scenes when they're doing their improv scenes and um and so he would just tell them to be doing bits whether or not he's plans on recording them or not because he didn't want them to know they were being recorded uh so he kind of used a voyeuristic documentary style to use a long lens to kind of spy on his actors doing their scenes rather than record his actors doing their scenes and um and this gives us sort of the voyeuristic feel around this time this was seen as kind of like this big theme um in 80s comics uh which makes me think that in film it might have been much earlier there was this thing about um criticizing the audience for spying on the characters like you are a voyeur you are you are a pervert watching these characters and so then in mash you have a lot of this nudity that you're kind of like in a weird way you're like in on the fun but because i i don't know i don't feel that this film really condemns the pervertedness very much like i think it kind of uh glorifies it actually and so this film is very dated there's a lot of racism there's a lot of um there's just a lot going on in every direction everything is everything is very much of its time which is part of its success is that even though it wasn't the greatest film, it was very much of its time. And so audiences really reacted to it because it was the right thing at the right time. Um, let's see. Uh, but yeah, so so we're, we're, we are also the voyeurs. We are also, we are to connect with the voyeurs who are peeping in a tent um, or... Um, you know, there's actually, uh, I was reading a book to prepare for this, and there's never enough time, so I never finished the book, um, but the, um, it was written by one of the doctors who was in a mash during, um, during the Korean War, and he, um, he, um, he said that they've never pulled down a, the, sh- the nurse's showers, however, someone a helicopter pilot did bring the helicopter close and blew away the tent and it was always suspected he did it on purpose but he denied it entirely um and so that was one of the shenanigans the mashy the mashy shenanigans Uh, and there was a woman showering in the tent 
which inspired the scene that uh, you'll see in this film. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think maybe the documentary style shows probably got inspiration from this. Um, let me see. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, the but none of the themes really come off particularly strongly to me. I don't really see a big codec moment that kind of makes me go like, oh, this is what this is about. I think the, the, um, um, there, like, if there is a theme or an opinion this film has, it says it quite loudly and directly. It's not really, so, so I don't really feel that, like, you know, this theme of nudity and voyeurism through the directing style, like, I just don't have the faith in the, product to then to make this argument right like i'm just like i don't have that authorial intent feeling here it just feels like coincidental or maybe found in the editing room uh but i don't it just doesn't i just don't have faith in that reading of it but um anyways uh but the um the the studios thought this film was trash they were like, this is, you ruined, you, you know, even though this is a low budget movie, you wasted all the money and it, this is worthless. And we don't want this coming out because they had two other film, two other war films coming out, which was Tora, Tora, Tora and Patton. And so they were like, this is going to ruin our war movie time. And uh, Altman talked them into doing a test screening and the test audiences absolutely fucking loved it because Altman uh intentionally obfuscated that this was the Korean War. He didn't really he he tried to avoid focusing on the Koreanness of it so that way when this movie came out during the Vietnam War, people would kind of start to associate it with the Vietnam War and people did and people wanted to see like anti-government, anti-war, anti um, you know, anti-draft sentiments and uh something that kind of makes a mockery of the government and so then you know you show this in the 1970s when it's like it's hard for any formal media to really release this release something like this and so there it really was like a release valve for something people really wanted right so the lacking of structure they didn't give a shit because they were so desperate to just have anything that supports it. And um, it's like uh, Muslims oftentimes are desperate to have any sort of representation. We don't even give a shit how bad it is, right? And so, like, you know, so a lot of times, like, when we were growing up, we'd be like, oh, yeah, there's a terrorist, then he's like us, right? And we didn't actually go like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um and uh let's see uh so why is this film good and bad i talked a little bit about it um openly criticized um uh redemptive aspects of the film seem very projected onto the film i'm kind of like i said i'm not really like enthusiastic about being like okay well this is this is what it's saying through nudity um uh, the themes kind of seem like they're there in the way like LaCroix technically has flavor. Like you, you basically, um, you basically just say, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to mention what chat's saying. Anyway, um, the, um, uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, like you can, you can, you can't say that the themes are not in this film, but whether they're strong or well-argued or even making a profound point, I don't know. I just don't, I just don't buy it. I think what's happening, though, is that the TV show was so good at making poignant arguments in these ideas that the, there's a confusion between the film and the movie. And the, the TV show was so popular and everyone knows what that stood for and how that worked. And I think that just bleeds into like a retconning of how profound the film is. 
Um, and, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, there's racist shit. There's, there's literally a character named Spear Chucker. And, um, he's added late in the film. And, um, because, God forbid, we include black characters in Act 1. Um, looking at Ghostbusters. Uh, anyway. Um, so, the, uh... And in the TV show, what there was like this irony where it was like um, they they kept Spear Chucker for the first season of the show, and then um, and then and they would have like these arguments where Alan Alda would be like 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 there would be a American soldier who's like uh, uh, using racist terms to talk to the Korean locals or talk about the Korean locals. And Alan Alda is like, I don't like that word. And then, and like Spear Chucker is in the scene reinforcing Alan Alda's perspective. And I'm just like, I like, I'm like, I can't tell if the irony is intentional. Like, I can't tell. I'm like, it's so good. It's so good if they're just like, we have Spear Chucker Jones here and he is, he is also pissed off at your use of this term, right? But also, it's like, where does MASH get off criticizing anyone? <laughs> and then eventually, they resolved the fact that they had a character named Spear Chucker Jones by just pretending he doesn't exist. They didn't send him off. Like, a lot of times when characters go off, they, um, what happens is their draft number runs out, right? Like, they do enough draft cards or they, or draft hours or they um or they get um or they get killed off right and um he they just stopped paying attention they're just like he's not here anymore and um and it wasn't really um and they didn't bring in another black doctor they just were like and he's gone because his name is a problem and it's like wait um anyway uh, they didn't do a great job of it, but also it's people in the 70s. What are you going to do? Um, let's see. Um, like, it's about as anti-racist as they're going to get, I suppose. Um, and, um, yeah, there's major homophobia in this film. Um, but it tries to do it in, like, a sympathetic manner. Um, let me see jokes about suicide. I mean, the theme song is literally called Suicide is Painless. Um, and, uh, um, let's see, uh, also, um, in the TV show, Father Mulcahy was used as a counter-argument to Major Burns's, like, Major Burns was a Christo-fascist, and Father Mulcahy was someone who is right with God, and so Father Mulcahy was, like, an anti-racist who looked up to the doctors, and tried to find a way to be meaningful in the Korean War, right? And uh, what he has to kind of learn is that, and even try to defend, is that, um, you know, saving a life is important, but the last rights of someone who is dying is also important, right? And so that would be a conflict and a argument made in the show. Um, in the film, they have exactly the same scene that is later on done in the show but the argument is fuck the last rites the living take precedence and like the film is basically like religion is for stupid fascists if you have religion you are a stupid fascist and the show decides to go a lot more nuanced than that they're like they're like there are christo fascists and those people are bad but the goodness inspired by God is, and the culture of people is not stupid, right? It's something that's very important. But this movie does not have that nuance or that sort of importance. Um, let's see. Um, so these doctors are funny, and but they're in the army, and this is based on a book that's nonfiction. So, or basically nonfiction, sold as fiction for probably for 
avoiding slander and criminality reasons. Uh, but how how does that work, basically? Uh, so this is actually really interesting. I really like this point. I really like the history of the mashes. Um, so basically, um, in World War II, uh, if someone was wounded, they would be rushed by ambulance maybe 15 minutes to the nearest hospital. And in a war zone, it's really hard to have a nearby hospital, especially when you're fighting a largely rural area, um, which the Korean War largely was. Like, you had these major cities, but you also had largely rural warfare. And uh, so what they needed were to kind of expedite treatment was they would create a these tents, like these tent mobile hospitals, MASH stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And so as the, as the line of the line of scrimmage, um, the front lines of the war moved, the army hospital would also follow about two to three miles behind the front line. And, um, and so the, so all the buildings are temporary. They're all tents. They're all makeshift. And the, um, so the, um, they also implement, this is also the first war where they started using, like, helicopters as evac. And so they were able to get people from being wounded to the hospital in a matter of minutes rather than, like, like in, in like, seconds almost, uh, depending on where the helicopter was versus, like, like, under five minutes versus 15 minutes to an hour, right? They also used ambulances, too, uh, depending on how many wounded and uh, how many choppers were available. Um, the, um, uh, but, so why does this translate to, like, goofiness? Um, so, after World War II, uh, so World, so around this time, being an army doctor meant you were basically a butcher. You were a shitty doctor. You could not make it in private practice. You had to work in the army because no one else would take you. And that was the way in which you could practice medicine without the liability of practicing medicine. Uh, because the army, uh, the army would have your back, basically. And uh, so being a army doctor was like the worst thing a doctor could be. Uh, but there was... You know, a lot of the drafted doc in World War II, they added the draft hour system. So before you could be drafted at the beginning of the war and you would then be kept until the end of the war. And um, or you could be drafted the last minute of the war and then you'd be let go immediately. Right. Um, and so in World War II, they were like, uh, we don't want to necessarily like lose all of our occupational forces. Uh, so we're going to have like this hour system for the later drafted people. So that way they don't just get to go home just by the arbitrary fact that they were drafted here yesterday. So, you know, a lot of people would then be stuck and those, those kinds of doctors would end up being like the Lieutenant colonels, like Lieutenant Colonel Blake, who's drafted, but also in charge. Right. Um, because he's been there longer because of seniority because he's been held over from like world war ii probably uh they don't say that specifically but um the book i was reading about the background of mashes um uh suggested that that's probably the case with colonel blake um the uh but anyway it's also why when the actor wanted to leave it was very easy to just say his draft his draft is over right um, he, he fulfilled his hours, he gets to go home. Um, but anyway, so the doctors, so they, and institute, so for the Korean War, they instituted what was called the doctor draft, because they didn't have enough doctors, because after World War II, uh, most of the doctors either, like, went into private practice the second the war was over, um, and there weren't very many, like, regular army doctors who were low ranked enough to be working on the field. Um, and so, um, the, um, 
And so what they needed was they just needed doctors to work in the field at the rank of between captain and lieutenant colonel. And so they um, they instituted the doctor draft, which would then get a lot of kids who are just out of school into like right into the military. And um, so a lot of the doctors did not want to be there because there was just they're just making up for a huge brain drain. But because there was such a huge brain drain, they were not being trained on the army way to do things. They were just said, you're a doctor, you know how to do surgery, go. And because of that, they didn't have good formal training or care for military discipline. Uh, and anytime someone would be like, try to implement military discipline, they would just kind of laugh it off and be like, what are you going to do, draft me? send me to Korea. This is the worst thing I could possibly imagine. I'm like a doctor and I'm two hours, I'm, I'm two minutes from the front lines. Like, what are you going to do? Arrest me? Arresting me would be an improvement. Fucking do it. Right. And so they're like, yeah, very Gen Z. Yeah. And so, so basically they just didn't care and they did everything on their own, but also world war one medicine really sucked. And also army tradition really sucked. And you combine these two things and you get really bad medicine. And so you get these fresh doctors with no one that they really answer to just being told to make it up as they go. And they're actually trained in good medicine for the first time in a long time. So now it's like, and they're seeing the worst trauma victims you could possibly see in the world. And they are just inventing new techniques. They also don't give a shit. They're also fucking around and no one, it's like a big frat party, but they're also inventing new medical, like new surgical techniques, new surgical tools, new, like, it's just like a, a huge boon for what we now have as modern surgical medicine came from these tents of like frat boys fucking around in, in Korea. <laughs> um, so I made an observation that Captain America would actually get the nihilism of Gen Z humor instantly because uh, the humor of that time had that out. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, let's see. Um, but what was also really good with these mashes is that they got so good at this that if you made it alive to a mash, there was a 95% chance you would live. Like, in, in general. Like, only 1 in 20 people tended to die if they made it to the mash alive. Uh, so their, their efficiency ratings were like through the roof, but then you'd still get army people coming in going, we need to teach you how to do surgery. And they're like, fuck you. You need to learn from us how to do surgery. We're the best here. Um, and so you really get the real antagonists in mash is the regular army doctors who are also Christo fascists, um, who are basically saying, tradition is more important than human lives and that's really the biggest theme of this film is that tradition that this is an evil belief that tradition is more important than human lives so uh so that's where you get this like hostility to religion it's where you get this hostility to um to uh bad to the bad doctors to the army doctors to regular army um, and so it's to be free is the most important thing. Um, and, uh, that's, uh, um, let me see. Um, yeah, uh, and, and the interesting thing with this film is that over time, uh, the, while the freedom comes with the, like, the argument of the theme is that freedom is inherently important, but because so many things of these of this film age so badly, it becomes its own counter argument on the theme of freedom, uh, because they just do racist things and sexually harass women, and it's like at the time it's like it's a fun jape, but then now it's uh, not fun rape. Um, anyway, that's, uh, um, yeah, so it's like the, it's like it, it, uh, it, it, 
and then it becomes its own counter argument that that basically there is a place for tradition because without the tradition these wild and crazy guys are fucking wild and crazy (laughs) um let's see um so let's talk about creative writing um i like to talk about the definitions i talked about talked earlier about how as a formalist writer i really like the definitions and the framework um your definitions determine what mistakes you'll make uh they also determine uh what your final stories will look like and uh, and for instance if your definition is good art of good art is too vague then um your artwork may come out being directionless or lacking focus if it's too narrow you'll become an artist who is obsessed with only confirmation bias um a lot of us went through computer science um uh, a lot of us went through uh uh not computer science oh my god my i i really believe in that like long covid neuron clumping because now it's just like field because like i will the the ideas are too intermixed right like and so anyway we went through creative writing not computer science not creative writing programs we've dealt with uh artists who have um we've dealt with artists who are both who either it's way too vague and so their stories have no focus they have no point um and then we have other like we saw other people who could only have one idea be what is good writing um and uh and even if you don't like other people's definitions it's important to know them and understand them because that will make you more flexible and you never know when that will save you uh when i was working with um so like I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of how Miyazaki writes, but when I was hired for Social Cipher, they were like, "We don't even know if you can write a story without conflict, right?" Uh, which, uh, when I get into the definitions of story from a Western perspective, you'll see why that's a problem, why that's like an inherent, like a major issue. But because I understood an Eastern philosophy of storytelling, which is not story as conflict, but rather story is a event that sends a community into a state of disharmony and the quest to restore harmony and so that is kind of how Miyazaki writes and so I knew this other definition that I never apply to my work but then they were like can you even write a story without conflict and I was like yes uh you're talking about this and so then i basically just uh we had the promise of writing miyazaki stories but then they kind of just kind of just turned it all into exposition and ruined the whole fucking thing but but (laughs) but i could have it could have been useful um anyway uh if they would have let me do things i could have given them miyazaki if they wanted um but anyway so what is story what is plot are they the same thing the answer is no uh the way that letters are not the words plot is not story plot is a means through which story is created but it is not story in itself uh plot is events happenings and or actions taken by characters in a narrative work it's what goes on in the story or what goes on in the piece. I'm trying to avoid using the words I'm trying to define. Um, (coughs) (coughs) Story is where things get exciting and worthwhile. Um, And we have largely Virginia Woolf to thank for that. So um, um, uh, she was describing a movement that was happening, but she definitely put into essay form to say, like, I am tired of reading about everybody's fucking outfit like you are because because in the 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 gregorian period that she was specifically talking about she was like um everybody fucking like like description is key and she was like i am sick of description being key character is key story is key right um but uh 
What's the O O T D? Outfit of the day. Outfit of the day, Trent. <laughs> yeah, she she was basically because like in Victorian era they were like, uh, we're gonna talk about fine people and fine things, and we're gonna describe it for you, plebes, because you'll never be able to look at these wonderful outfits right and virginia wolf was like i don't need to know about every goddamn button on your fucking outfit tell me what people are thinking what they want what they're doing right um and so um uh so virginia wolf was like a big part of pushing us to what we then know is as modernism uh there were a lot of other people involved in it but uh i look at virginia wolf as like the key the key person who really who really solidified everything that modern literature kind of is and put it in an essay and was like here like here this is it do it um, but uh anyway um let's see um but anyway so story is uh so the simplest definition that i've seen for story is story is conflict this is a western definition um eastern definitions traditionally have been more like the Miyazaki definition that I said before but they're not always necessarily um you know like there are different approaches to storytelling and uh different paradigms and so this is what I'm talking about is from a western paradigm I am a writer in the English language and so I am basically working from a western paradigm otherwise the Western English speakers who publish things are not going to understand my story. They're going to think I'm bad at writing story and they're going to fucking tell me that I need to get good noob rather than understand. Like I, you cannot have faith that a publisher is going to know other paradigms of storytelling. You could barely have faith that the publisher knows this paradigm of storytelling. Um, I mean, honestly, like as of like a few years ago, I had publishers still telling me like, we'd publish you if you, had more twitter followers i'm like are you fucking like are you fucking high like this the hell side is dying and this is even before elon musk um but uh you know publishers i have a lot to say about why publishers publish bad things and don't do good work and a big part of it is uh the people who read for the publishers usually have a bachelor's degree and so you're getting phds and master's people having their work vetted by someone with a bachelor's degree and their ability their sensibilities as to what is good and what is not good is not refined enough to necessarily be able to include things that are good for finer reasons um let me see uh it also explains why most most books are published at the eighth grade level and when you try to publish even at like the ninth grade level like your drop off is huge um anyway uh so story uh is um so we're going with the definition of story as conflict and most definitions of story usually are just a deconstruction of what does this mean and so uh um it's story is conflict is a good definition to work with uh but uh someone using just this as their guide can easily go awry thinking as long as everybody is yelling at each other you have a story and that's not necessarily the truth that's not necessarily the truth um and uh you know and it's not really a good guide towards making good art the more specific your definitions are without being too um exclusionary the more of a guide your definition of good art will be and a definition of what good story is or even what story is um <laughs> and uh um let's see uh yeah, Chris actually makes a good point. Publishers print dumb stuff and reject good stuff and then go, why don't people read anymore? Like, I do believe that reading is the most superior art form because um, there's, there's theory regarding this, mostly comics theory, which is basically the idea that the more abstract a narrative, uh, more abstract something is, the more people connect with it because they're... It activates their brain more to fill in the gaps and people really like their own authorship 
And so if you're reading a book and you're imagining how the characters look, you think that character looks really great for that character. Uh, and you're really excited about how you imagined you thought the character would be. Uh, but if you're watching a film, then you might be like, I don't know about this actor, this casting, this visual, like, I don't know, I don't like how it looked, I don't like how, you know, like, there's a lot more to pull you out of it. Um, and so the more abstract a media is, the more people tend to be engaged with it. But uh, people are overworked because of capitalism, we don't have, feel we have the luxury to take time to read and so we like more passive uh less energy draining forms of entertainment like like film and stuff like that that are more passive um and that's why these media have like surpassed every other one uh but but basically it's like people don't read because they don't have the time and the energy but also um publishers want to hit lowest common denominator and are afraid to publish good work because they'll say i don't know how to market this and it's like well if something is easily marketed then what you're doing is you're saying that it easily fits into a paradigm and probably then isn't very interesting um yeah yeah people uh let me see i do believe the most superior art form because i'm not ready for the existential crisis if that's not true nice <laughs> that's a good joke okay people people being mad that hermione may not be white even though there is no explicit description requiring it yeah that's true um also rue in um the hunger games this was a big thing is that people reading the books sort of skipped over that she was black like it was maybe like a sentence that's another thing too that's another that's i i talk about this with my editors because editors are like lean it up cut out everything and i'll be like this is story ram right the author the the reader has only so much in their head and because it's important you can't rely on one sentence to convey that information so you have to design redundancy in the system so that way people otherwise people will get lost and they blame you because they skipped a sentence or don't remember a sentence or put the book down and came back six months later right and um i think even katniss was described as explicitly non-white with olive skin and yet yeah um and so but anyway so people may have missed the description that rue was black and then um when there was like a trailer or when the movie came out people were like what i that's not how i pictured rue you you broke my head canon and it's like uh and then people brought up the text and we're like it's in the text and you know so that tells you about like understanding your literary form um you need to like you need redundancies in your text uh, writers tend to be really much about like efficiency and uh co concision and uh using the least words possible in like from like a poetry aesthetic poetry you can do it when your whole piece is two sentences long yeah you want to you you can just barely mention it in like uh half a phoneme and imply that imply that logic but if you're doing like a novel you need to re-up re the information otherwise it'll suffer bit rot and die and not make it to people's final co conceptualization of what the story even is right um and if it's important then then do that but also i'm also wondering if maybe the author was like if i write that she's black one time I'll get away with making her black, <laughs> right? Or like, instead of saying like Katniss Evergreen was, you know, was a Greek woman, like you just go like olive skin and then just fuck off, right? Like, um, like it's one of those things of like slip in the information to people who otherwise may want to censor it. Um, because like, if you say Katniss Evergreen is specifically any demographic, then people are going to say, oh, and now she is, now this is it, like it changes the shape of the bookstores your book shows up in right like if if she's white she's in barnes and noble if she's black 
then she's in your local she's in your local book st- black owned bookstore right and that's that that changes your demographics very quickly um and that it's just sort of the racism of publishing um and i don't know how to circumvent that i'm having a hard time uh my big thing was i didn't want to be like a arab writer uh i wanted to just be a writer and who's really good and i wanted to be kind of more like the non-white writer like than because like as i was writing like unicorns that i make specifically palestinian right um the more i realized like my vietnamese friends had the same childhood and (laughs) when we when we were growing up together we had the same childhood and so i was like i'm gonna make fictional characters and it's like this just represents diaspora right and uh anyway that 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 got me off topic uh let me see um we have a lot of pages because i'm going through the foundations of story here uh, of creative writing this is like creative writing first class first intro day um so anyway um so story is where things get exciting uh it's where we actually are engaged in a plot line is based upon uh our interest in the story so conflict does get our interest but we need to deconstruct what is conflict um uh in order to have conflict you need to have a person who is in conflict uh this is the character um and the character needs to want something because otherwise there's no reason to fight for something so you there in order for conflict to exist there needs to be a person in conflict and they need to want something they need to have a desire so character and desire and in order for there to be a fight there needs to be something that's keeping the character from that desire because if the desire is just fulfilled then it's not a story there's no conflict there if you want a sandwich and you get the sandwich then uh the end right like uh but if you um and now you can catastrophize simple things into a huge story and that's a lot of what postmodernism did is postmodernism said uh our perspectives are not objective there are they're relative and so if you're like i am too fucking tired to get a sandwich and I need to develop the, the wherewithal to get the sandwich. And then in a lot of postmodern narratives, you would have the quest where it's like, and now you're out of peanut butter. Now you got to go to the corner store. Now the corner store is being robbed. And now this is right. And so you'd have all these things and it's like, you just want a fucking sandwich. And I think that says a lot about late stage capitalism, about how like excessively expansive the amount of work is towards reward. Um, Let's see. Uh, let me see. Uh, and so then, so basically, story breaks down. This is the story. This is the definition of story I was taught in my first creative writing class: is that story is character, desire, and conflict. However, we were just defining conflict, so I'm going to change conflict to antagonism. So, and it's also more accurate to say that. So, story is character, desire, and antagonism. Um, uh, but if you're going to be a writer and you're you need to know how terms are taught and things uh character or story is character desire and conflict that is um that is how it's taught um i don't like it but that's how it's taught um and so um let's see so this definition makes story, but it doesn't necessarily make for good story. In, a literary, in literary terms, we would want to add stakes. What is at stake for a character? Uh, this is where you would want to use the character, their desire, and their conflict to shape the situation. A story would be Jessica wants to watch Pokemon, but Dad wants to watch the news. Right? We have Jessica, who has a want and then there's antagonism and so we technically satisfy story but if we tweak these elements and plus them then we can actually start looking for better story uh so jessica the living pokedex needs to watch the next episode of pokemon where they will announce a new pokemon 
or she will lose her identity as the Pokemon expert to fucking Bobby. Fuck Bobby. Fuck Bobby. But Dad wants to watch the fucking news, right? That's a much better story. So now we have stakes. Now there's something... It's not just a matter of watching Pokemon or who controls the TV. Now it's like her sense of who she is is in peril because she is the schoolyard expert of all the Pokemans. And um, I hate holidays because then people with like a mini bike will just have every family member take a spin around the block. It's all that we're hearing the bikes and not like explosions. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's family visiting, because you'd get this at Thanksgiving, so it's family visiting versus 4th of July. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, okay, so now, um, uh, because she has allowed a commodified product to define her sense of identity. Too real. Yeah, that's basically, um, the sandwich is the only one that performs abortions. Oh, the sandwich. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, makes for vampire film. Team up with other novelists. Uh, they understand the importance of stakes. Yeah. Uh, come for a great lecture. <laughs> Leave because I'm too snarky. Uh, let me see. Um, okay. Um, okay, so... Okay, so we've created strong personal stakes. This isn't objectively the end of the world, but personally, it is the end of the world. In a later lecture, I'll talk about universal stakes, personal stakes... Uh, and other stakes, uh, other types of stakes, because that's actually a Sharif theory. That is not like a, that's not a lecture that I've received. That's a lecture I put together uh, for the My Little Pony fandom. I actually delivered this originally with My Little Pony uh, at a pony convention, and I came up with that theory for that convention. Um, anyway, uh, uh, but unfeeling dad is an okay antagonist, uh, but a good antagonist, it's a good antagonist with unfair power. Um, but also, um, how does she ever, then how does she ever watch Pokemon if dad, if, if Pokemon conflicts with the news? So now we're getting plot problems, right? We're getting, um, and so, uh, uh, so that's something that needs to be resolved. It can be resolved in a simple line. It could be, you know, maybe dad is off work today, something, you know, very easy to fix. But we can also try pushing the story even further. Uh, before writing, it's good to reverse the perspectives as if the antagonist is the hero of their own story. So dad has to choose between looking cruel or teaching his daughter... Oh, oh sorry, I skipped a thing. Okay. Um... Oh yeah, so how does she how does she ever watch Pokemon if it conflicts with the news? So, uh, Jessica, the living Pokedex, needs to watch the next episode of Pokemon where they will announce the new Pokemon or she will lose her identity to fucking Bobby. But Dad wants to watch the news because an airplane just struck the second tower. <sighs> like... <laughs> But that's a that's a big that's a big point of conflict, right? Like now, Dad's watching the news is so is important on the other end of the of the conflict. So now, um, and so now we might look at it as reversing reversing the perspectives of the antagonist um, as the hero of their own story. Uh, Dad has to choose between looking cruel and denying his daughter television for no reason, or teaching his daughter that she lives in a world where mommies and daddies can go to work and not come home when she wants to watch Pokemon while this historic event unfolds, right? So now we have more complexity to the story. Um, so now we're going from just, like, children's book to, like, literary short fiction. Um, and, uh... Also, look at the themes that are uh, coming out in the story as we play them. Uh, Jessica's motivation is maintaining her identity. What if we play this from the opposite side as well? Jessica is now Fatima. And so now we say, in a Muslim American household, a young Fatima wants to watch an important episode of Pokemon to retain her identity as the human Pokedex on the morning of September 11th. But her dad won't let her near TV because he doesn't want her introduction to her Muslim identity to be an act of international terrorism. 
like that is now we're in like Hemingway. Hemingway wishes he had this storyline, right? So now this is like a very complex thing. And this is how we build story. And so we could have the same plot of events where it's just baby, like baby is mad at dad because they're fighting over the TV. Kid says that dad is cruel or mean or whatever, things like that. We could have the same thing, but story is that subtext. Story is that important story. Story creates these lines that really shape what the plot, why the plot matters, why the plot is important. And um, uh, now, at least in the scope of this narrative, we've created a zero sum game. There are some fallacies in here, uh, in the thinking here, but that's okay because it's with personal stakes. All that matters is how things are important to the character rather than how things are important to the objective reality. Uh, I'll talk more about personal stakes later. Um, let's see. Uh, I would be talking about... Um, character desire character character uh, dramatic need and dramatic want here i was planning to save that to apply it to a film where that's more prevalent than in this film they did not really do character desire and conflict um and uh it would be really good to kind of teach uh that as it comes in but character desire and character oh my god i'm using the wrong terms uh, char dramatic want and dramatic need are very cinema based aesthetics. You would, if you talk to a literary writer, they probably would not know what this means. Uh, what I talked about is strictly from a literary perspective, and dramatic want and dramatic need comes from a writing form that is more structured and since we're looking at things without structure i'm not really going to talk about it uh in this in this time but since everyone here has already heard about dramatic want and dramatic need uh i would instruct you to look at this and go how there is a lack of dramatic want and need ever established through this film uh, whereas through the show you would actually see dramatic wants and dramatic needs established per episode um, and then that gives more direction and more focus. Um, the uh, one good one good ability of a um, a tour director is that you learn how to bullshit your what doesn't work about your artwork as an intentional thing. So there's no structure in Mash, and Altman kind of knows it. So then he says that the structure is that it is episodic, right? And it is because if you have a bunch of individual scenes and the scenes have their own character desire and conflict because that's how the improv actors created it right then it does seem like a ton of x episodes but that's kind of a natural like evolution rather than something that was intended or planned i really feel like it's it's bullshit right like um so like um ej ko's book red uh, people really were like, um, the language is weird. It's incomprehensible. Like, it's incomprehensible. I can't read it. And so E.J. Co. basically said, well, it's experimental. It's highly avant-garde. And it's like, no, you just tried to be very overly poetic and didn't think about clarity and you didn't listen to any of your editors as one of those editors who got fired trying to tell her to fix the fucking book uh i can tell you that is absolutely fucking true um, and that destroyed the book she ended up taking it off the marketplace in shame because she was like this is going to ruin my career uh because it was so indecipherable and bad and who is going to have faith that this person and now she's having a new debut book coming out um so it's it's amazing how you get to get to bullshit the world like that all the time <laughs> anyway um um what is the experiment if nobody can understand what it's trying for yeah basically then it becomes a failure and yeah katie you're right like the uh it's a bug and not a, it's 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 a that kind of logic of it's a feature not a bug is kind of um is how people hide it but what your your comment here is saying 
it's not or actually no I, I keep dyslexic reading it so yeah you were saying it's not a bug it's a feature yeah um let's see um okay you guys are on the sandwich okay anyway uh but yeah chris was saying uh what is an experiment if nobody can understand what you're trying for and that's very true and that's why codex exists that's why you want to have codex that even if and this is like evangelion right evangelion is where um you know you can cynically say in evangelion uh hideaki Anno fails because so many people can't grasp what the thing is about but he puts in so many codex and so much information and he has so many like overt and heavy-handed conversations that are like what is the hedgehog's dilemma <laughs> right <laughs> that it really kind of feels like you know it's kind of the audience's fault that we can't put it together right um and uh and i think really the big problem with evangelion is that um partial for the west i know the problem is that in the east it's very common to use um partial symbolism so masada wears a cross and people are like so she's jesus so she's a savior she's a sacrifice like what what's going on here right and in the movie she ends up being kind of the sacrificial lamb so she does kind of die for shinji's sins and um it's kind of uh her blood that the new world is kind of built out of right um like you see it on the cross like her blood on the cross at the end if i remember the scene correctly also if i remember which version correctly because it's anyway uh because that was a problem with evangelion that i started talking about scenes that were in a part of this series that was not assigned to be viewed anyway uh so anyhow but also uh in the east i feel like there's a lot of writing in evangelion that makes it hard to receive because it's uh layers upon layers and also more about feelings and and things like that but anyway codec is proof that the author at least understands what they're trying for that is absolutely it, it gives you faith in artistic intent and it gives you faith that there's a point right um a lot of you everyone who's present today is pretty active on my facebook but i you saw that my post about um where they were trying to where cracked was trying to say that it was a mistake in fight club that uh tyler durden durden um is criticizing the advertisement saying what does what man actually looks like that and then he looks like that in the next scene and the thing is is that the criticism and they're like see it's a mistake and i'm really angry with modern internet literary criticism or media criticism is i'm gonna spot the mistake instead of this thing speaks out or this thing sticks out so therefore it may be a clue as to how to interpret the information um and uh, and then think about that. Yeah, Cinema Sins. Cinema Sins is right a lot of the times, but also uh, Cinema Sins also has a problem where they're kind of just a bad audience member. Uh, I mean, by nature of it. And so sometimes you have to just be like, yeah, but, you know, you got to be kind of a good audience member and just sort of let the pretense of the form happen, right? Yeah. Um, yeah let's let's less media criticism more entertainment it's more i feel like it's more hey let me talk about thing you like and then you're like ooh, thing i like that's a thing i like i like the thing i like and then that's really the point of it is to say uh thing you like plus me talking about it now you like me it's getting a little too <laughs> see at least i recognize <laughs> i'm self-aware i'm self-aware which makes me better than all the people who suck <laughs> which is literally a bojack horseman argument this is not going well for me <laughs> anyway um okay so um 
All right, so the next thing to know to enjoy MASH, to understand MASH, um, to um, talks go off the rails, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, is that it exists on... Is that structure works on a scene level, on the level of the whole work, and on the level of the sequence, or on the level of the act. Um, the scene is just sort of... Um, in strict screenwriting terms, a scene is um, everything that's happening under one heading of a um, location, right? Um, a sequence is a series of scenes that make up kind of the, um, the their totality kind of works like a scene. Or so it's so scenes and sequences are kind of arbitrarily different in that it is the differences of locale, differences of shot. Sometimes the sequence is really just a scene on a different level. Like you, you've seen like 80s teen films where somebody will be giving exposition and then they just change location, change location, change location, trying to make the exposition superficially more interesting to deal with. And, uh, but really all, even though technically that's like five scenes, it really could have been shot in one. And it's the, the function of the sequence is that it works as one scene. Sometimes you have a series of scenes that make a sequence where the sequence is greater than the sum of the scenes. And that's a great sequence. That's a great plotting of a sequence. Um, but anyway, so, so structure should be applied ideally at the scene level, the sequence level, the act level, and the entire film level. Um, and so knowing this, you can look at how MASH works and how MASH doesn't work. Uh, in terms of creative writing techniques, uh, MASH, the TV show, warms my heart. MASH, the film, sends me into anaphylaxis. Uh, I am very allergic to this style, but we'll talk about it as, as a legitimate way of telling story. <laughs> this is a style of story that is becoming more and more popular, and I think it's becoming more and more popular because the access to education is becoming harder and harder on top of that. No one wants to read a book in order to pursue knowledge of education because most of my master's degree probably could be replaced with a guided tour of like five books that probably add up to a hundred dollars new. I could get them at a used bookstore for probably less. And I pay and I'm like eighty thousand dollars in debt for that. <laughs> it's fantastic um okay so um i really don't like this but but anyway so the story of the philosophy of a series of a series of moments when is basically the idea that you are telling a story by just making event happen after event happen and it's very easy and the thing is is that the problem with the story of moments when, or the benefit of the story of moments when, is that it's very intuitive. It's very much how we tell stories. Um, and it can even be done very well. Um, but the thing is, is that it can also be done very badly very quickly. Um, the uh, one way we can look at it, a story of moments when, and, and that's the thing, like, Every story is kind of told as a series of moments when. Because basically a series of moments when just means uh, the story contains notable moments that happen. And if you're writing an exciting story, even if those moments are small or moments that are big, then, uh, you know, like it could be firing photon torpedoes into a Death Star trench using the magical whims of the Force, right? Uh, so now you've discovered God and God helped you in your holy jihad against the empire, right? And so that's a big moment uh, because then you keep the planet from exploding. Or it could be the moment, you know, 
after a character failed their quest, they go back home living with their parents and their parents just go, do you want something to eat? Right? Like, uh, after all the fighting about whether, when is this person going to do something for themselves? And this character goes out and they try their hardest and they fail on their head and they just come back home and then like mom and dad instead of being like fuck you see you're a loser you're whatever they're just like do you want something to eat right like that that like ceasefire or that recognition of effort from the parent and that attempt for love that then becomes that's bigger than blowing up the death star right like because the death star is like very plotty but that other thing is story that other thing means something it's so important whereas like the death star is like an inevitability you know even though they do all these things to say this is impossible you know from the the genre that luke is going to win the day right um in people's defense why would you read a book uh when you're undergoing constant realization that society you live in is structured to punish most people for not maximizing the value of your labor as a commodity and reading is only loosely correlated uh with improvement of one's labor value uh, like, I think this is less these idiots today, and yet uh, another way our economic structure alienates people from the things that they otherwise might find enjoyable. Uh, I mean, I think so, but also, if you think about it, people are willing to go to school and buy a commodity of education to get this type of information, because, um, but then when it comes to the book, you probably spend a lot more time doing homework and things like that to increase the value of your labor. But for whatever reason, like the book seems like more of a luxury or um, or perhaps it's like too boring or difficult. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, uh, Death Star is fixed poison across the universe, but your parents are not berating you and just asking you if you'd like something to eat is not. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's so the Death Star is universal stakes uh the parents not berating you is personal stakes and personal stakes are always far more important than universal stakes it's also kind of why it seems so cheap that like um in die hard uh john mcclain just defeats the bad guys and then his wife is like i love you again right <laughs> and and so it's like because the personal stakes was the marriage but the that was not at all related to the plot and so if you if it was more integral to the plot then um although i think she was in the building right like it was like the building she worked i don't remember um that i feel like maybe that's like an unfair shot but still maybe it's but i guess that's the thing he didn't do a dramatic action that results in the conflict yeah in that it's just it, uh in plot wise it's intermingled but story wise there's no there's no antagonism that is overcome from that storyline only from the other storyline and so then we 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 accept that antagonism from the main storyline can substitute for antagonism in the romantic storyline so it's like basically um snape what's his name alan rickman gets to be stand-in for his wife and so he can shoot his wife's hate of him out or push him out the window or however i how, however he does that I, I have a i have an image of alan rickman falling out a window so i'm just assuming that's it anyway <laughs> um, maybe uh if when he gets to the department store he gets her a gift and she said that <laughs> that she wanted way back and at the end bleeding she comes to him and uh he reveals the present he managed to get I think Alan Rickman falls off the building. Yeah, so uh, that that actually would fix the thing if there was something in the or a conversation over the radio or something like that where um, where he like basically what is the point of the conflict in the um, in the relationship that then is resolved 
through this action through this thing and so as so like the, this experience changes him into somebody who then appreciates kind of the finality of life right or the the finiteness of this thing and then appreciate it um so series of moments when um also works as a um you could also kind of look at it as like memeable moments, right? Um, and this isn't necessarily a new thing. This is kind of how we naturally look at story. Um, and so, like, I mean, if we look at it, what is the symbol you think of with Hamlet? It's almost always, even on printed materials, a skull. And the skull, the Yorick soliloquy, does not really have much to do with the plot. It's more about exploring themes of the play. Um, and uh, But that's such a moment when, when Hamlet is talking to gravediggers and holding the skull of his clown from when he was a kid. Uh, like, that's such a moment when, and an iconic image, that that has become the symbol of Hamlet, rather than, like, um, you know... I guess it's harder to symbolize like, you know, stabbing a dude behind curtains, but even then like, or talking to ghosts, but even then these are moments when, right? Like we think about, um, and, um, uh, so, so there is like legitimacy to writing a story as stories of moments when, but there is a problem that, uh, writing a story, so when you write with a structured narrative with dramatic want and need in mind and a definition of story that is centered around a large central conflict, what you end up doing is you create a story engine that allows you to go from beginning to end on one tank of gas, right? But when you do moments when, what ends up happening is it's kind of like you're just, you have to refuel every single time your moment runs out. So you're like, okay, we're doing this now. And then you play it out, and then it comes to an end. And then there's no natural progression to the next thing. So then you just sort of get another tank of gas, and you just go again. In fact, it's almost more like instead of refueling your boat, you're abandoning your boat, finding another boat, and then taking that boat until that boat runs out of gas until eventually you get to the end and it doesn't seem like there's very much cohesion in the journey because each step of the journey would be like a different boat um and um and so that this was actually something i found was the problem with social cipher was that they were so built on making their uh vertical slice of the game that the end of their first arc everything was resolved so they basically just got all this momentum and then crashed it into a sandbar and then i was like okay you need to build a direction in which the whole game is going and we need to pull this fucking boat out of the sandbar and then get it going to our full like i was like okay we can look at the vertical slice as just this is act one we're introducing all the characters we're getting in this is fantastic it works as a great act one but now we need to go to our central adventure and what our thing is about. So I created a story bible for them. I created, uh, you know, arcs in which how the other narratives would go. Did the world building. Did the lore. Did all this stuff. And then just uh, got fucking bulldozed every step of the way. And so we didn't really ever get to actually make the final thing. And I was like, if you just keep making story like this... You're always your next person because I'm fucking quitting. Um, the next person who has to do this is going to have to drudge your ship out of the sandbar and try to get the forward momentum going all over again. And you're not going to you're not going to like it. They're not going to like it. It's going to be a very difficult task. And um, and uh, I don't know. One of the writers ran away, but also she was one of the, she's someone who runs away from jobs all the time. So. Um, I can't tell you what, uh, what, whether, whether it was their doing or not. Um, so what both Shakespeare and MASH do very well is they create contrast in their scenes. Um, there's juxtaposition of scenes. Uh, contrast is everything in art. Um, 
uh, and uh, because the brain reconciles how these things work together uh, when they're so different. Uh, it's a lot like the humor theory with Azumanga Daio. Um, the, uh, the brain is getting excited for different and interesting stimuli, but also in reconciling how these two things fit together. Um, and, uh, um, and it's a matter of design. Um, artists making opposite ideas working in harmony is kind of good design. And avoiding uh, conflict, which in design terms is bad, uh, is design elements not working well together. Um, but which is not good versus conflict and story, which is good. Um, anyway, um, and, uh, and so in storytelling, you want things to be different and similar without being, a, a, without being monotonous. You want them to be analogous without being monotonous. And what's interesting is I'd argue that MASH kind of does both, uh, especially if you're not really a fan of how the, like, the specific antics they're taking because you're like, oof, that's rapey or oof, that's, uh, really violating somebody, <laughs> right? Like that's not okay. Um, uh, so, uh, but if you're having fun on going along with it, then, and like with the humor theory stuff is that it's very interesting if your moral compass does not prevent you, if your super ego does not prevent you from enjoying it, it'll be very enjoyable. Which is why a 1970s audience loved the shit out of it, right? Uh, even though there was no structure, even though there was no throughway, and there, even though there was arguably no point, and uh, but it was a series of moments when, and they were a riot, and so they loved it. They laughed at it. The theater was the test theater was a hoot. It became everybody's favorite. Um, but a modern audience is going to have objections, and so it's going to be significantly less funny. Um, which this is kind of expired woke. It is, this was woke for its time. This was anti-government, anti-war, anti all this other stuff. It was about thinking for yourself and anti-conformity. Uh, but everything else makes it expire. And in fact, a lot of the things in here were expired before they were made. Um, it was just a matter of being, um, incendiary, uh, and, uh, Someone coming on. Oh. Oh, Kat's here. Hi, Kat. You missed most of the lecture. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, so, yeah. Actually, even even if you just came like two minutes earlier, it would have been useful to you. I'll, I'll repeat that. Uh, so, so, basically, I was talking about how... Um, MASH does contrasting scenes very well. And that is something that's important for writing is that you want things to be analogous, but not monotonous. And uh, you want things to have contrast without clashing. And so then you kind of need to design your scenes, design your narrative around. Um, so that way things are interesting and different um, and have a sense of forward momentum, which is not something MASH does. Uh, we're looking at MASH kind of as a negative inspiration in a lot of ways, but also positive inspiration as to, well, then if this movie is so bad, then why is it so good, right? Like, why is it a classic film? Um, and I find you actually learn a lot from negative inspiration, a lot more from negative inspiration than you do from positive inspiration, because when things are working too well, it's hard to see why it's working so well, because it's like good editing becomes invisible to you. Uh, bad editing becomes very apparent and so you always notice the bad cuts and so the bad cuts teach you more about what good editing looks like than good editing because uh, it's hard to recognize it um, and uh, let's see um, uh, so we'll talk more about structure-free narrative and kind of its problems I'm going to repeat a lot of the stuff here because um, uh, I kind of want to watch Bee and Puppy Cat and talk about some of the similar things uh, that Bee and Puppy Cat does correct with a structure-free narrative, but also why that instinctive narrative 
style also creates a lot of preventable problems that just coming at it with a uh, sense of structure and a sense of a, a stronger definition of what a story should be um, would have fixed. But with Bee and Puppycat, it's largely vibes, right? Which also is kind of how MASH is. It's like different vibes. And that's what Robert Altman is kind of good at, is he's good at creating a vibe for a scene. Um, and uh, with MASH, you're constantly going back and forth between serious and dramatic and uh, comedic and aloof. Um, let me see. Uh the last thing, and if I don't explain this, it's going to be hard. This film is going to be hard to watch. But basically, improv writing uh, and improv scene construction. Uh, so these actors are so so. Cat, what I was saying earlier was that these the script was thrown away for this movie. Um, the hold on, PlayStation wants to turn off. Okay. Um, so the script was thrown away. It had like um, the director just agreed to shoot this movie and then took kind of the general feel of every scene and the general happenings of every scene and then just like um recorded the act told the actors to improvise the scenes and so the only sense of conflict in these stories or uh, is basically the conflict that they've created. So it's basically the movie was written by improvisational actors rather than by the screenwriter because they just threw away the screenplay. Ironically, the screenwriter was the only one to win an Oscar because he was still credited as the screenwriter of the film. So not a single word of this is the screenwriter's actual dialogue, but uh, he was the one who ended up collecting the only Oscar this film won. Um, and, uh, so, so the key to improv is, um, is the phrase yes and, and what the phrase yes and means is it doesn't just mean to go along with anything the other person is saying, uh, cause otherwise then you start becoming a pushover and scenes require conflicts. And so, um, the thing is, is it's to find the conflict that, these characters are going to have in the scene either with each other or with the situation or something else right uh so what the yes means is that you if your partner establishes something as true you agree that that thing is true unless it's so absolutely ridiculous that the point of conflict has to be around whether or not that thing is true but um uh but usually if they're saying this is this is what's happening you're a bad improv partner if you just say no it's not and then try to take control uh you're supposed to work together you're supposed to listen to each other and listen to what the scene has made because if and you also have to be mindful of what you're building together because if you you can build yourself into a trap very easily or you can even escalate the scene way too high, way too quick, and then you don't know how to bring it down. That's why there's actually a rule in improv, which is no guns, right? Because once you bring, once you go pull out a gun, you steal all the agency, you steal all the power, you steal everything, and then your improv partner has nothing to do, right? Uh, of course, uh, I used to live with five improv comedians, and one of them said, no, what you just do is you just go like, you, you just walk up to them and you just take the gun and, and you throw it away. And then if they pull out another gun, you just take that one and then you just do it for as long as, the, as long as they're going to be an asshole about it. Right. Like you can be an asshole back. Um, but, uh, anyway, um, and, uh, so, um, and so the, so that's what yes means and yes. And, and means that you are also going to build things in the scene you're not supposed to just sit there and let your partner do all the work. So one of the rules of improv is that you don't typically ask questions because every time it's you exchange turns to talk, uh, you're establishing something in the scene or you're making a dramatic beat, a beat like a dramatic action to further the story or further the plot. 
as you go back and forth on this, um, you have to establish, like, but if you start asking questions and becoming like an interrogator, then it's on the, it's on your partner to do all the work and you're just reflecting your turn back to them. And so it's kind of a dick move to ask questions. It's always going to happen, but you try to keep that to a minimum. But if, if you keep asking questions, your improv partners would never want to work with you again. Um, and um, the, uh, but sometimes asking a question is because your partner is establishing something. And then you might want to ask a question to just give them the excuse to further establish what they're establishing. Um, there's also context of knowledge. Does this, if my character can't know something, then, then they can't establish it. So they may use a question to ask the other person to establish it so my character can get into the scene, right? Um, and, uh, but, you know, there, there are kind of rules around it. Also, you need to, uh, there was something I had. It was like, you need to listen to what is establishing, but, um, it's not bad improv comedian with a gun. It's a good improv comedian with a gun. Um, Agent Michaels. Um, yeah. And so, so I'm going to talk about, uh, improv scene. Um, I don't know if this, how improv this is, cause it's such at the beginning and it's establishing the characters, but, um, oh, status, status is a big thing who has control and who doesn't. Um, and, uh, so anyway, uh, and so since this is the military, we have ideas of who should be in charge, uh, based upon their ranking and some of the background with the, um, doctors is that even though they're drafted even though they're new if you're drafted as a doctor your rank is immediately captain so you're not private you're not like sergeant or corporal you're immediately a captain if you are drafted into the military as a doctor um so uh there are people who are regular army who are um who are lower ranked than this draftee who doesn't even want to be here um, so that, be that creates then a power imbalance in those situations. But then you also have like, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel who is not regular army. He is a draftee. And so he's also part of the insane asylum that everyone else is in. Uh, whereas one of the nurses, Major Houlihan, and then you have Major Burns who are kind of middle ranked. And so that, uh, where Lieutenant Colonel is above them, but everyone else they're dealing with is beneath them and so then there's this status where it's like they have the formal power but the characters don't acknowledge the ranks of the military and so they are um so they have the scene status they have the status in the scene because they have all the cards and so that's something to pay attention to in a lot of these scenes i'm really looking for value in this film um, and there is value but you have to look at the scene level rather than the movie level um and uh, so let's look at this one scene towards the beginning of it um so hawkeye arrives at camp or not at camp, but he arrives at in Korea, and uh, he waits to he waits by an army jeep. He's commanded by a superior officer to wait by the jeep until the other doctor shows up. Um, Hawkeye's bag is having trouble closing, and so Hawkeye. This is the closest to like a good opening image we get for this film, is that Hawkeye doesn't um he doesn't respect the military so he takes his captain's bars and he tries to use them to close his bag to pin his bag shut and so after he puts and so now we have story memory happening because now he's taken off his sign of his rank which means he has uh, what's called um blank sleeves so it's like basically he has no rank now he is he has renounced his rank um, for the simple pleasure of closing his dysfunctional army bag. Um, and so he applies. So, so then the other doctor shows up and the doctor thinks he's a private because he has no insignia uh, to signify that he is of rank. So then the doctor, who is the same rank, starts bullying him around saying, like, is this our jeep? 
you need to take me to mash 4077 now and he's and hawkeye is like well actually and then he's like don't give me that shit you need to take me over to 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 the to the mash right now and whatever and then he just goes yes sir right like and so we get uh so so he uses the bars to to uh to pin his bag shut so now we have story memory where his uniform is now without those bars and so uh that's immediately paid off by duke entering the scene and duke accepts the situation that the that hawkeye doesn't have the bars so he plays off, so he builds off of that situation saying yes you don't have your rank and I'm going to now boss you around because I do have rank. Um, and then, um, uh, and so then he goes, I'm going to boss you around to tell you to take me to this place, even though you were just ordered by someone else to stay here. I'm going to give you conflicting orders, which then creates a sense of conflict for Hawkeye. And there's also a direct sense of conflict between these two characters because one is trying to order him and Hawkeye is like, uh, so then he has that rare instance where, um, where pushing back is good improv. So he's like, yes, you are pushing me around and you, yes, you do think that I am a private, but I'm going to explain the situation. And also you don't want to interrupt your improv partners, but in this case, the scene would be resolved if he gets the chance to explain the situation. So then Duke interrupts him and says no i'm not going to take any of that shit so that's actually good scene building even though it violates an improv rule and so by bulldozing him then hawkeye goes yes and and follows the order that he has just been given and steals the jeep despite the orders of the of the of the commanding officer earlier um let's see um so the, the improv improv writing is really good at introducing characters and communicating situations very effectively. That's one of the powers of improv writing. I don't think it's as powerful as Hollywood really likes to think. If you have like Upright Citizens Brigade or Groundlings on your resume, people think like you're God in this city. And I don't think improv writing really gives you that much power that isn't easily learnable. Uh, outside of but I had five roommates who were improv comedians who took those classes and I had to hear about it um, so I got them I got it through osmosis um, let's see not every character in this film is important uh, but they didn't want to hire extras uh, so all the actors were given the character with lore and backstory uh, so they could be playing the scenes with their partners uh, I said this earlier but I'm going back but basically um, uh, so the director wanted character the the actors playing out scenes, and the director would use a zoom lens, and so and all the actors were lobbed up, so they had a, a lav mic on them, and had their own audio being recorded locally on them. Um, so the director would just use a long lens, and the actors wouldn't know whether they were being recorded or not by the vid by the video, by the film camera. They only knew that they were being recorded audio. And uh, so uh, this gave kind of a voyeuristic look to the film. And that, um, um, anyway, so so this is kind of the benefit. So, so Kat, I started off kind of complaining about how everyone is obsessed with like setting and uh, world building and lore. Uh, and so... I did some talk about how story works. Um, I'll, I'll try to get this video uploaded as soon as I can. So you can maybe go back to it, but, um, the, um, but basically, cause it would be too long to go back over. Um, but the, um, but basically this is a point where setting lore and everything, um, setting lore and everything, uh, is important. It is very, valuable in this thing and in improv writing you do kind of set it up but also improv writing kind of shows why why it's not so important to really load down on lore because it's like everything can change in a second someone just says a line and now their entire personal history changes and so being too married to establishing lore ahead of time 
can sometimes be a procrastination technique. Uh, I feel it's when writers are afraid to really get into the thing. Um, some lore and setting and backstory are really important, but at a certain point you have to just say, and I'm going to discover whatever else I need as I go. Um, and let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, sequences uh, built out of scenes or pre established uh, Oh yeah, so some not everything is improv in the moment or from the script. Sometimes things would be established in a previous improv scene and then they would make an entire sequence out of it. The most notable is the suicide scene in this film. Um, it is the most planned section of film and it's also where we actually get meaningful shots. Uh, I would probably say maybe one meaningful shot and it's pretty obvious and why it's there is... Uh, pretty obvious as well um, the only thing I would say that makes two shots meaningful is that the obvious meaningful shot comes from the perspective of Father Mulcahy so he is seeing it in a certain context um, which also then kind of goes against some of the themes anyway um, so the last thing we'll talk about I think this is the last thing we're talking about, uh, is beating, is playing a game or beating the hell out of a game. Um, we talked a little bit about this with Azumanga Daio. Um, basically, a character has a bit or a thing they tend to do or a defining characteristic uh, that creates humor. Uh, maybe it's an understanding. Maybe it's a misunderstanding. Usually it's a misunderstanding. Um, and... And the thing is, beating the hell out of the game is you constantly bring it up or you constantly shape your character or you shape their scene from that perspective. So, like, Osaka definitely all the time with the things that she has imagined. Like, say, the she imagines that Cho's, if you take out her pigtails, she'll die. And so if someone starts tugging on her pigtails or goes near her pigtails, she's like, no, don't, right? Like, she'll always believe that to be true. That is a game she is playing, and they'll return back to it. Or the, the, the cat. Um, the, 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 yeah, the quiet girl will always try to pet anything cute. That's her game. She is obsessed with cute things, but also cute things hate her. And so she will actually, like, try to pet... Anytime something is cute, she will try to pursue it, try to pet it. But cute things tend to hate her or otherwise evade her. And so that's the game she plays. Um, in uh, M.A.S.H., the two obvious ones are that Henry Blake only knows what he's talking about about 50% of the time. Uh, you give him a piece of paper, he'll be like, oh, great, great, great. Sometimes he'll understand it. Uh, other times he'll miss very obvious details. Um, uh, Radar has the most obvious game, which is he can know what you're going to say before you say it. So as the characters talk over each other, Radar is actually speaking before his commanding officer gives him the commands. So Radar will finish saying his own orders before the commanding officer can get them out uh, and so there will always be an echo where radar will start talking and then at the very end so radar will be like and then i'm going to change the numbers on the jeep and then the commanding officer will be like and change those numbers on that jeep right and and, and which shows that there's this power inversion um the uh uh, a writer for Extreme Ghostbusters, uh, Dean Steffen, taught me that humor is the inversion of status and power dynamics. It is a, uh, he said, humor is a stupid person in charge and a smart subordinate uh, that they kick around. Um, I read this more as comedy can come from an inversion of power dynamics, which is what we see a lot in MASH. Um, I think I'll bring up how, uh, just a quick thing for Kat is that um, historically, uh, there's an antagonism here that is not really brought up very well in the film. It's more brought up in the show, and even then, not very well. Um, army doctors suck. 
And so army doctors were very bad. They were based in tradition. They were taught by other army doctors how to be bad army doctors. And so there was all this regulation to say how and when you do what procedure and how. But when all the doctors, there was a brain drain in the army after World War II, and so they had to draft all these brand new doctors for the Korean War. And so they were fresh out of med school with good ideas, and there was no one around. There were very few doctors around to try to push them around. And so since the draftees outnumbered the old doctors, they basically came in, received no training, very little boot camp, and they basically were just like told, you know how to be a surgeon, go be a surgeon or a dentist or whatever. And so they just did whatever the fuck they wanted and they kind of fucked around. Like the fucking around in this film is like game development. Yes. Um, but the fucking around in this film is actually his fairly historically accurate. Um, maybe not these specific incidents, but definitely the tone and sometimes even the severity. Um, and so the, um, so basically because no one told them how, no one trained them, there was no tradition, um, there is a conflict between the regular army people who were people who wanted to be doctors in the army, which they usually did so because they were not good enough for private practice, right? But some of them just are Christo-fascists who believe in the army, right? And then you have the these drafty doctors who are just like, uh, I'm going to save lives my own way, fuck tradition, fuck this other thing, I'm too good at this. Which actually is why the Mashes created a lot of great medical advances that we now, because basically you're getting good doctors dealing with the worst trauma a human body could go through, and their job is to try to fix it. And so... Um, and what this did was actually um, the survival rate of war dramatically went up through this experiment of the the doctor draft and through the MASH, which was just a mobile army hospital that they would put right at the front, like two miles away from the front, um, instead of having to fly someone to Tokyo because they got a gunshot in Korea, right? Like not very efficient or to another, to like a Seoul hospital. Uh, but then you're overloading Seoul's hospital with wounded, right? So then you, uh, so their idea was that you could stabilize someone in a MASH unit and then send them to Tokyo instead of sending them to every single person uh, to Seoul. Because if they are recently wounded and the MASH units are overrun, sending them to Seoul might be better than sending, like it's it would be a death sentence to send them to Tokyo. So the MASH units were typically a way station between either Tokyo or like San Francisco even. So um, anyway, so this whole thing was like um, really good medical experiment uh, that really, and it really was just a matter of throwing away the way the army did things. And so you see this conflict in this movie where people who are majors in the military because they've risen their way up are... Um, are they believe in the military and they're Christo fascists and they're like, you dishonor my my sacred army and uh, but it's nineteen seventies so the sentiment is fuck your army um, <laughs> and definitely a sentiment that's returning today uh, anyway uh, so that's it uh, um, and so now now movie time uh, thanks for this was this was a long lecture. Uh, a lot of it included basic uh, creative writing, intro to creative writing, uh, and history and things like that. So uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, and now for the movie. Um, 